first of all, we need to talk about why property tax matters. Why does the tax matter? What is the most important thing that a property tax gives us? Why do we, why do we impose a property tax? You know, yes, the school di districts receive about 50% of property tax. Counties uh, receive 20 to 30%. Municipalities and special districts and special service districts receive about 20 to 25% of the property tax. So um, it's a primary source of funding for local government. That is the number one reason we're here talking about property tax today. But there are other reasons that the property tax matters. Tell me what you think they are. What do you know about the property tax? Did I pay it once a year? Very good. Are you happy about paying it once a year? Good, Marilyn. Good. Nobody likes to pay the property tax. Property tax is the most unpopular tax, and the reason for that is you pay it once a year, and it's a big amount of money, unless you pay it through your, you escrow through your mortgage. But sales tax, every time you buy something, you pay the sales tax. You pay income tax every time you receive your paycheck. Money is withheld. Property tax on your property is it is collected basically once a year. Anything else about the property tax? Did you know that it's the oldest tax we have here in Utah? The saints, or the, or the saints, I should say the, the pioneers were not in the valley until, uh, for two years, until they had established a tax on value was really a tax on wealth, but, but that's basically a property tax. And 16 years prior to statehood, which was, what, 1896? Is that when Utah became a state? 16 years, 16 to 18 years prior to that, they had established a property tax, both on personal property and real property in Utah. So it's a very old tax. And the state relied upon the property tax up until the 1930s. And then after the Great Depression, the state kind of moved away from property tax and started relying on sales tax and income tax for revenue. However, the property tax remained a primary source of revenue for local government and, has, and, and is so even to, until today. Another important um, uh, item about the property tax uh, that most people do not realize is that it um, correlates directly with uh, debt. The higher the value, the more money you can borrow. Did you know that? Not just that, but um, most of your uh, debt, your general obligation bonds, are, are financed through property tax. And the reason those bonding companies do that is because they know it's a stable tax, they know they're gonna get their money, so the risk is low. And in fact, Utahns are very good at paying uh, their property tax. There's seldom, if ever, I don't even know of any defaults. And that pulls the interest rate way down, and not only does it pull the interest rate down, it increases the bond rating. So we do get lower interest rates. So property tax is important for debt financing. Um, property tax is complex. It's complicated. There's lots of facets to it. And we, we like to compare it to a a big machine with lots of different parts. And these parts need to work well together to make the whole system work and function and, and uh, maximize the benefit of the, of the tax. It, it's, it's complicated, and because it's complicated, we have, we, uh, 
have developed a calendar that helps kind of organize the activities that occur during the year in the property tax arena. In your manual, um, at the beginning of the manual, there's a, a calendar and I want to draw your attention to that because that I think you will find useful as you uh, work in the property tax system. You can look at that calendar and it's, it's by month, it gives the date, it gives the major activities and remember these are only major activities and then who's, who the primary person is that's responsible for that activity and the statutory authority for the uh, property tax activity. So kind of use that calendar as you're, as you're going through the year and, and it will help you understand what's going on in the property tax arena. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the property tax is old we have a historical outline of the uh, different uh, changes to property tax and that will be located right after the calendar. It's called the Historical Overview of Utah's Property Tax System. Now what we have listed here, we couldn't list all the changes. Uh, there are many changes that occur in the property tax system every year. So these are just the major changes by year since the, the year of statehood. And uh, we don't have 2015's uh, data in there, but we do have the, um, the 2015 property tax related legislation that we will add to the historical overview. But we'll only add maybe three or four or five items to the historical overview. Every year after the legislature goes home. The property tax division goes through the legislation enacted by the legislature and they provide this summary on an annual basis and we put that on our web page. We, we place it on our web, post it on our web page and you can go in and read that and I would recommend that you do that. You read that um, on an annual basis so that you can keep up with what's occurring in the property tax arena. I did a little study and for the last five years there were at least 17 separate pieces or separate uh, led, pieces of legislation, uh, bills enacted by the legislature. That's a lot to remember, that's a lot to cover. And you don't have to read all of those bills. You can read that summary and if something perks your interest, you want to find more about it, You've got the bill number, you can go look up the bill. But that, that's um, a service that the property tax division provides for the counties. And look for that on our web page. We'll leave it on the web page until 2016 when the legislature goes home, and then we'll put the 2016 legislation on the web page so that helps you keep up with what's going on. Now, does everybody like to stay out of trouble? Do you want to stay out of trouble? Well, you know, I've worked in the property tax uh, area for a few years, actually more than a few years. And the best advice that I can give you is this. Follow the law. Follow the law. That will keep you out of trouble. Let me give you an example, and it happened just the other day. I had one of the counties call me and the person on the end of the phone said, uh, Ruth Ann, he said, uh, you know, I have a FAA uh, application in here. Uh, now, the code says that those applications are due May 1. Well, it's now May 20th. Um, is there any wiggle room? Is there any wiggle room? Could we accept this application? Well, I'm an old stick in the mud when it comes to the, co the statute and the law. I said, well, you know, I pulled out my code and sure enough, we read together the application deadline for that app FAA application was May 1. I said, the law says May 1. You know, there's no wiggle room there. However, if the uh, applicant is uh, very insistent upon it, then have him file an appeal 
to the Board of Equalization. And this person said to me, well, you know, we want to, you know, minimize the work that the board has. We, you know, let, we need to make that decision. I said, no, no, no. The board makes that decision. Just, you need to follow the law. And so, you know, just, just tell the applicant to file an appeal with the Board of Equalization. Now, a lot of times, they won't do it. They, they don't want to go to the effort to file the appeal to the Board of Equalization. That's okay, too. That's their choice. But they do have a choice to file an appeal with the Board of Equalization. That is your out. It's your out with tax relief, exemptions, everything. Follow the law, and if somebody wants to squiggle the law around, just have them file an appeal with the Board of Equalization. Then you stay out of trouble. It's the Board of Equalization, that is their job to make those judgments. So that's a, a piece of advice that I call it my, my training ma mantra because it, I just think it is so important and I, I have seen many instances where if people had followed the law, they would have stayed out of trouble.